hard what's, to me. What's even stranger about that, Andy, is 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 you. Like your your dad sounds like the type of person who just does normal things. By the way, we're live. Um, and and now I won't say normal things. I mean, what oh, like how judgmental is that? But like, you know, I would have never guessed that your dad was like somebody who'd race. You know, kind of like get into an accident from racing too fast. <laughs> oh yeah, he used to like do drag racing and stuff. So. <laughs> Yep, and and we play board games. <laughs> I'm a nerd. Well, you're among friends here. You you're preaching to the choir. Yeah. So I don't know. De- Dennis and Jeans just produce oddness. Period. It's just the direction <laughs> the oddness takes. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't want to be like relegated as even being a nerd. I like. I sort of like reject any label. I don't yeah. know. I'm only okay with labels I assign to people. Or you, you could be that, like that one host on Fox News who said, "I'm a millennial. We don't we don't accept labels." Yeah, I, actually, in a weird situation, I I feel like I don't know the context it's in, so maybe I should just. No, the funny say- part is that she said, "I'm a millennial," which is a label. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It is, but I mean, like, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> being a millennial is a label that's like, you know, I was born in the 50s. You know, is that a label, Andy? I was born in the 50s. Yeah, it's called old. <laughs> <laughs> that's a label you're assigning, but, like, I don't know. Like, being a millennial is like, I was born this time, you know? I mean, there's transitions, though, between the generations and stuff. It's interesting. Uh, we, w- we recently saw a play at the Civic Center that seemed to be about sort of the transitioning from baby boomers to Generation X and Y and millennials. So I feel like my old man stories are going to be like, I remember days when I had to get up to turn the channel. Andy, your old man stories are already happening, and they're happening every time you see somebody play a game that's not like Phil Eklund or, or economic. Yeah. That's just <laughs> All right, well, uh, we'll go ahead and get this off kicked off here, on. Trent. I see your – I, I kind of can't – oh, the seventh in seventh in, seventh continent or the seventh in continents? Are you, are you having issues, Trent? No, but seventh continent is. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> if it causes incontinence, I don't want anything to do with it. I have enough problems in that department. <laughs> just uh, just, just wear, wear an outfit, you know, and you'll be fine. I mean, seriously, like – it's not that big of a deal. I accept you, Trent. Anyway. Depends. Yeah. It, it doesn't <laughs> depend. It doesn't depend, Andy. <laughs> depends or no depends. Yes. Good stuff. It depends. <laughs> when, when astronauts wear them, they're called maximum absorbency garments. <laughs> well, I see the astronauts ones are probably much more comfortable than depends. I, I, uh, one of the most entertaining like pieces of criticism I ever read was a guy who uh, was was testing um, adult diapers, like you know, rating them once against the other, and you know what he found was, uh, you know, it was it was a hilarious, hilarious, the most probably the most humorous thing I've ever read. Um, but he um, he found that the American brands of adult diaper are largely being sold and purchased by sold to and purchased by. Um, like nursing homes. And so they're, they're like quantity over quality by far. Um, yeah. Whereas like European brands of adult diapers are very much like being purchased largely by like, you know, consumers and, and uh, people who actually want like, you know, comfort and uh, like he went into all the different, you know, like, like these were, there were different like bullet points in his review of things that he was looking for in every one. And uh, yeah, the way that he did his research is, was a, a subject of, of personal shame and that he, he did a great job of, um, you know, explaining. So I was largely inspired by by this uh, that to you know to start my own um, sort of source of criticism. You know, it, it was really like that 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 article was was so a turning you as an adult diapers. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got there yet, Andy. I'm starting with board games. Adult diapers are down the road. Dude. <laughs> adult diapers comes later. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it'll be even worse. We'll review feminine hygiene products. <laughs> Oh yes, because what can be more more horrible than three white males reviewing feminine hygiene products? Oh, uh, yeah, that would be. 
I don't think we would have frame of reference, Andy. It, it would not work. <laughs> I don't think our race would be relevant for that. I just think in general, like, you know, the, the, our gender definitions, but yeah. Um, but I would definitely bring on uh, somebody who, who I think could really help with my adult diaper uh, review series. And that would be my little brother, Will Salen, who's here in our chat, in our comments. He's, uh, he's participating. So, hey, Will, um, I'm, you know, when I say I'm buying a 12 pack, it doesn't mean I'm coming with beverages, dude. It means we're we're doing this this diaper review thing. That's 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 in our future. <laughs> if anybody knows how to deal with that not so fresh feeling, it's Will. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it just you know, it, it, it will really be up to the product, though. That's what we're. It's you know. It, we're we're just we're just the the vehicles. We're just the channels. I I'm gonna stop, man. This is a <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So yeah, adult diapers will be on the uh, the next episode, I guess. But if, if we can just, we'll make it a whole topic. <laughs> <laughs> we just all uh, it'll be a bunch of board games to adult diapers metaphors. So. Um, Will Salins joined us here in my in the chat. He's he's my little brother. So thanks for for being here, Will. We've also got Paul from our uh, from our local gaming group, who I hope is feeling better. He's he's uh boy, he has been through the ringer. It sounds like with with health and this uh, the the good old snows of April have not been helping with that uh, as we've been dealing with here um, in Iowa. It is just ridiculous, the nasty weather, and I feel bad for all my students. I really do. I honestly, I mean, I feel bad that that. After five solid days of no snow days, no snow delays, nothing, we get hit with like the most disgusting three day, or like two and a half days of weather for this weekend, like Friday evening all the way into Sunday night. You know, just the whole weekend was either torrential downpours or, or you know, like mixed, eventually ending up with several inches of snow. So, I mean, yeah. they're not able to do anything outside. I'm not able to go even outside to walk the dogs without, you know, having them come back in and come in like basically small snowmen because their their hair gets all the, the snow caught in it. But also like then I'm expecting them to like just go right back at it the next the next week. It's like, no, this is this is rough. Like I totally feel for you guys. That sucks. Yeah. We had family up from Oklahoma. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's like and that's when you're like, like I'm sorry. Yeah. That, it's all right. <laughs> This is this is what my life is like. This is <laughs> my life. Well, they, yeah, they called me and they're like, "What should we pack for the twins?" Because I have two twin little nephews. I was like, uh, "Winter gear, probably some swimsuits as well. Uh, scuba gear would not be out of reason, you know, just in case we're <laughs> underwater at the time." <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, yeah, it sounds like for once, living clear up in Fargo, North Dakota is 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 a good thing talking about weather they missed the whole band of snow that came and just smoked us all um to the east so anyway welcome colon i was hoping that you would be here for this episode because we are going to be talking about culling the collection so we'll have colon here while we cull our collections colon combo okay we'll go ahead and get kicked off three Two, one. Hello, and welcome to The Good, The Board, and The Ugly, a podcast about board games. I am the host of The Good, The Board, and The Ugly, and I am the, the duller out of the worst puns of all time, the punful puns of, of uh, board games and apparently adult diapers and snow and and uh, and, and our, our listeners' first names. So I, I, I appreciate all your patience with me. Um, and, and I will try to pull the punches as we keep going. I hate myself. Why am I doing this? Oh, I'm not I'm here by myself. Bad. Unfortunately, you won't have to listen to that anymore. We also have Andrew Dennison, who I am talking above. I'm so sorry for that, Andy. What were you trying to say? I said, I'm a dad. I at least have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you're not the only father here. We're also being... I've also got uh, Trent Ham joining us uh, as as he always does. Um, uh, no, this is a post. This is not a post um, Taekwondo episode, right? That's Tuesdays and Fridays now. So yep. we we got Trent at full recharge level, sort at of. least sort of, yeah, <laughs> as, as much as you can be with with yes. the late time. So, um, but he's not the only father that's part of the podcast. Actually, uh, TC Reed out there in the West Coast is is at his 
Daughter's Musical, Shrek Jr., which I know that uh, my wife, as the assistant director of our local high school theater, is uh, has been tossing around the idea of maybe doing Shrek at one point. So I, I will no, be listening for his Tuesdays reveal. with Maury the Musical. <laughs> <laughs> Trent will be our narrator. We're going to pull in yes. like some, some voice talent. <laughs> Um, and he, you, you changed it, Trent, before I could share with the world that your hype t- for today's episode is going to be Wednesdays with Trent, the, uh, the, <laughs> the long awaited follow up. Except who you are and revel in it. Tuesdays yeah. with Maury. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we don't well, want Trent is... to be that either. He would have to be like on his deathbed. We want to keep doing the podcast. So, no, no, Trent can't be next. <laughs> yeah, it might be the end of it, but you know, it would be a way to go out with style, maybe. I don't know, or or the absence of it. It would be going down in flames, I guess. You know, love is how you stay alive, even after you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> even after you're gone, uh, just you know, heart heartbreaking, heartbreaking to you know, not to me, but it's got to be to somebody, right? Well. Yep. We talk about board games, uh, you know, when we're not quoting Tuesday with the Mori's or coming up with absolutely agonizing, um, antagonizing alliteration. So, um, which is apparently the way that I'm describing this 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 hosting of of today's episode. Uh, we're going to be talking about culling our game collections. That means uh, how do we pick what games go into our collection, and how do we do we after we have uh, started to bulge. Um, in terms of being able to d- just struggle finding space for our games, um, what do you do uh, when you go through and decide, you know, which of your games to keep and which ones not to keep? So um, Trent has a lot of experience, having had a collection that's lasted for decades. And uh, Andy, on the other hand, has recent most is the recent uh, game collection color, even though that doesn't happen very often for him. He just actually got rid of a game last night. So and and I watch the transaction. If he, if he tries to no, I've got I've got evidence, evidence, eyewitness testimony. Is and, not uh, good. And I am going to be the. <laughs> he's not good. Yeah, it doesn't feel. Um, this episode, I will be. I would say the sort of like the caller in. You know that person who's like, I've got a problem. Like, dear Cheryl, I have too many games. What can I do? And yeah, it's it's going to come out that. Uh, um, I should probably have my credit card taken from me and uh, kept in a locked vault where I can't, uh, you know, I can't grab it because I have a difficult time keeping from. As soon as something inspires me, I'm like, ooh. Um, especially if they have it at Game Surplus, which is the sponsor of this podcast. Game Surplus, check them out at GameSurplus.com, uh, where you can find all those games that you can later on cull from your collection. So <laughs> I, I would say this, though, that uh, so far the games I've purchased from Game Surplus have not made it onto any of my chopping blocks that I have that I have made. My hypothetical chopping blocks, I should say, because uh, nothing yet so far has actually been chopped. It's just kind of sitting there on the chopping block while the butcher is uh, out away on vacation. Now, I'm going to be honest. On the other hand, I've actually thrown away three games I've gotten from Game Surplus. Thrown away in the garbage. Yeah, because they were the exit. Oh, oh the box game. <laughs> okay, I. This is how bad of a problem I have. I still haven't thrown those away. I'm keeping them on a shelf. Okay, because... that's pretty bad. That's pretty. That's pretty bad. Yeah, they're literally just so those games exited your collection. Oh, they had. Yeah, Andy, thank you. Thank you. Right now, you just took that spotlight from me, and I appreciate it because I was starting to get nervous. Uh, but yeah, I still have those exit games, and I think it's because I'm like, you know, I want to still do maybe like a review or something. That's what I'm hanging on to it for. But you know, at some point, like you know, w- when is enough enough, right? When is enough enough? And I, I agree with your decision, Trent. Um, I I need to have the strength. So you know, I guess <laughs> just like my parents, says my little brother here in the chat, my parents have had that struggle. And yeah, okay, that's it, guys. Uh, you know, tomorrow you're just gonna be like, uh, you're gonna you're gonna look. Uh, at our next recording, and it's just going to be an empty room, and I'm going to be like, I, lo- I I got rid of them all. I got rid of them all. See, that's you what happens me when you far. let me, me organize things. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, my wife's boy. like, you threw away a family heirloom. I'm like, no one was using it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and I've, I mean, I've been in that situation, so really, like, it's very hypocritical of me to not 
especially the, the destructible games. Like, what's wrong with me? Uh, certainly not just that, as you'll you, find out as we keep you going. You haven't unlocked all their secrets. <laughs> <laughs> unlocked. I haven't unlocked the secrets of Mystery at Stargazer's Manor so I could exit the the the, the deckscape. Ugh. No, it's it just ends there. So, um, well, let's go ahead and kick it off with reviews before we uh, just start our topic right from the top. Uh, we are... <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, uh, he, he, the chat is a fun place to be, and I hope that uh, I hope that listeners out there uh, know we, we are recording on on an off night, and I just I'm, I'm just so happy to see uh, that our community is here to support us. So, and, and it's nice to see. I mean, probably tonight works better for some people. Good to see you there, Norm, as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> and Norm tells me make more shelves, which has kind of been my strategy so far. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, you know my excuse is I use those games at school. That's why they're stored at school because they're part of my game group games, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. That well, uh, let's go ahead and kick things off with reviews. And first, we'll start off with you, Trent, because your review is kind of a. I think you're going to have a little bit of pride seeping into this uh, this discussion. Yes. Uh... I'm going to, instead of reviewing a specific game, I want to talk about an uh, experience of going to a Legend of the Five Rings tournament. Uh, I went with my son to a fairly large tournament in Des Moines. There was a roughly 20 people there, if I recall correctly. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, there was going to be quite a few more, but as Joe mentioned earlier, that we had a lot of snow in the area this weekend, and it cut <laughs> some people away. We still got almost 20 people there. And my son and I went down there, and we had a great time. Uh, I learned a few things about L5R when I was playing, and it was just a great experience. The community is really friendly and everything. The thing is, I wanted to report this much. My son did better than I did. He had a much better <laughs> record than I did at this tournament. I did not do well. And part of that reason was is I changed my deck radically like the night before the tournament. <laughs> That's I, not the first time you've done that in a competitive game, Trent. I, yeah. I think I've seen you do that before. Yeah, I just altered everything and built something completely different the night before the tournament and took it down there, and I only won one game the whole time. So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty bad. What I really learned about L5R, like especially preparing and playing at this tournament, is that the game is very, very decision-rich. There is decisions nonstop in this, and there's a lot of things to notice and pay attention to. I think it is the most cognitively heavy of the alpha LCGs, and I've played literally all of them. I think it is the hardest one to do well at. I think it relies more on the player making good choices than any of them. Other than maybe Netrunner early on, Netrunner might have been close, but as it evolved, it moved away from that, sadly. Uh -huh. Um the game. The only real complaint about it I have is the games can go on overly long. If the it can go kind of long if the players are really balanced, and both players are getting a remotely decent draw off their deck, games can go on a fair amount of time. But that's really about the and my a fair amount of time. I mean, what is the minutes. tournament clock? Uh sixty minutes. Oh, okay. Did a lot of games get cut off by that? Some did. Some didn't. I would say the most most were done before the clock. Okay. Most of them. Uh, I would say, on average, they were finishing probably around 40 to 45 minutes. Some of them were quite a bit shorter. Uh, there's, I don't want to say a combo deck that's fairly popular, but there's one that can win fairly quickly. It just charges in really fast. And if you're not prepared for that, you can just get steamrolled. Uh, I'm thinking of a particular lion deck that someone was playing, if anyone plays it. Um, but it's a very enjoyable game. The thing I really enjoy most about it is, is one, it gives... It's a game I've really bonded with my son over a lot, with a lot. That's great. Uh, there's a good, nice community locally for it. It's the biggest tournament I've been to in the local area for an LCG, I think, ever. And I've been to se for several of the LCGs, I've been to tournaments. And this is probably, I mean, in terms of local support, L5R seems really healthy. And uh, I really enjoy it because of the amount of decisions. And I feel like it has a lot more to do with the player than anything else. You're rewarded for prepping for these events. You're rewarded for playing a lot because you get you feel yourself really getting better. And it doesn't feel like a game that's completely decided by luck, as I often feel Magic is. I feel like there's a little luck in this, but it's a lot less than Magic. And so I enjoy it. highly recommend it. And I'm sure TC would be here uh, completely agreeing with me if he was here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a really fun game. It's given me a ch chance to bond with my son. It's a game I would happily play with anybody. 
Legend of the Five Rings. It's great. Well, sweet, dude. I'm glad that you had such a great time. And I'm glad to see that there's still a community supporting it. And I do think that, you know, um, the, the fact that it's taking place in a little bit more of a population center than, than uh, you know, I, I mean, still not exactly a big city by by any stretch of the word, but, you know, getting, getting more people in the potential um, pool is nice to be able to draw from. Also, um, <clears throat> it's good to see this continue because I hadn't heard much about L5R. I felt like, you know, they made some interesting decisions in terms of how they release the expansion packs where it's like one a week for like six weeks, right? Yes. Uh, the way they're releasing with this is compared to the other LCGs is it feels like they're spacing things out more, but then when they come, they come in bigger bursts. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's, I mean, it's up to them to figure out whether that's good or bad, but it feels like when we do get new cards, there's a big chunk of them. But yeah. there's bigger gaps between the card releases. Sure. Is it kind of, does it start to look more like magic at that point? Because, I mean, you know, that's what you've got, like, with the card releases, when how many hundred cards get released all at the same time. Yeah, I, almost. I think when they do a big cycle at once or have a clan pack at once, it does almost feel like a magic expansion. But, I mean, it's an LCG, which means you just buy the pack and you have all the cards. There's no, like, booster hunting or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it does feel like, I mean, when this first cycle... It feels like the game has changed significantly each time they've had a big release. And there's now been three of them, the core game, the first cycle, and the first clan pack. I feel like the game changed a lot after each of those releases. A lot. So, mm -hmm. and then they give it time to figure out what's going on in between each one. And then another big dump is happening in July. I think it's in the next big dump of cards that's happening. <laughs> calling him a dump yeah it's just like, I, I don't know what else to call it there's like 100 120 new cards coming out in july and july and august i think so yeah unique 120 uniques right yep. yeah it's ridiculous so um that'd be interesting you know it, it would definitely be like consistently looking you'd be looking towards the new cards that are coming out and looking towards like the announcements a little bit maybe a little bit more frequently you know it just felt like with the dropping of packs once a month it was it was good to have that consistently there, but then at the same time, like it felt like people were consistently discussing cards that were going to be released in like you know six months or in two chapter packs in the future. So yeah, I, I felt like with uh, other games I played, like the game was shifting, but it would shift really slow and gradually. Mm -hmm. Whereas the way they're doing L five R, there isn't any cards for three or four months. Then they hit, and everything changes, and yeah. you might as well just rebuild everything because nothing works anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of yeah. That was that was kind of what ended up pushing me out of my latest LCG. So of my only well, I guess no. I've I've done a, done a couple of LCGs, but one of them I don't think I don't consider as ever having totally left behind because uh, being a cooperative game, Lord of the Rings, the card game doesn't really require me to study so much. You know, like be a part of a meta, so to say. But anyway, um, I, I think it's interesting, Trent, Trent. That one of the things you mentioned is just how you have been there for like every LCG, and I was kind of like trying to pick that apart because anytime somebody speaks in absolutes, I'm like. Hmm, am I gonna play semantics here? But no, like you, you have like every LCG, right? Like, like starting was I played was, all of them. Was Netrunner the first big LCG, or were there? No, I mean, were, we've also uh, got Game of Thrones first edition is before that, as was Warhammer Invasion. I played both of those. And then did you play the Warhammer Conquest, the most recent one? Yes, I. There was actually a guy in our local area that also played it. One of the people that actually used to come to game nights. And him and I, he and I would play it, and I got a bunch of core sets from a local shop that was like basically dumping them. Yeah. And so that's how I got some cards for Conquest. I really wanted to try it out. Sure. I thought I thought that game was interesting, but I I'm not a fan of the theme. I'm not big on Warhammer. I'm kind of mad. Yeah. So yeah, I am too. I, I think it was funny. Like we have a Warhammer player in our local group. Um, or he, I guess he plays War Machine. I shouldn't say Warhammer, but he also plays. I know he's very familiar with Warhammer, and it was funny to hear him, like, he, he made some comment that was like, if we ever get found by other species, they're going to look at us and be like, oh my goodness, you have animals and plants on your on your world that are capable of eating other animals and plants. Like, how do you let this happen? How have you not crushed them? And I was like, yeah, I totally didn't see, like, I felt like he was going to talk about how our species seems so unevolved, but like, that that angle on things is just like Warhammer is just all war all the time. Yep. So and yeah, it's not really one that necessarily interests me as well. But yeah, it's 
Um, I definitely know that there's a lot of people, you know, it fits it fits what it's going to do with its uh, miniatures theme. So yep. anyway, thanks, Trent, for that L5R rundown. Yeah. And uh, congrats to your son, Joe, right? Yes. Uh, he, if he had won his last match, he would have won quite a bit of store credit. Nice. Crazy. So, I mean, he did really well. I was very but He impressed. got runner up in the tournament, right? Out of 14 uh, he, people. He wasn't. I don't know how the final standings went up, but I know he was near. He did very well. I don't know what the final standings were. Way, okay. way, way ahead of me. I will say, let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so uh, that was that old L5R tournament that that uh, Trent talks about, and now let's hear Andy talking about a, um, I guess, not like I feel like. All, all three of us here. I guess if we're going to cheat, we may as well all three cheat, right, Andy? You're, you're not yeah. reviewing a game necessarily. You're more going to be uh, going on a bit of a rant. Uh, just a brief one. Because, um, you know, the newest uh, Phil Eklund games are getting out there and whatnot and, and other games. And when I look on BGG, there's like, uh, it's like a ridiculous amount of questions. And I don't know. I feel like every time... I read a, a review about a Phil Eklund game. At some point, they have to go, well, the rule book's horrible. Um, <laughs> it, I don't know. I don't think they're that bad. I just think they think they require a time investment. It's not a game you can just read the rule book and magically know what you're doing with it. You have to sit down, you know, look at the pieces, play around with the pieces while you're reading the rules. Um and I think heavier games like that just require more effort into learning, which I think is important. So, and it also depends what kind of game you're looking for. Like when you get into a Sierra Madre game, game is only part of what they're offering you. They're essentially offering you sort of an education into a topic as well. So it's not meant to be a game that you can, you know, pick up, play quickly within an hour right from the rules and know what the heck you're doing on it. So, and I don't even think that the rule books are bad anymore. I would say some of the early ones probably were, but I think everything you need to play is in there. It's just that you have to walk through the game, move the pieces while you're learning it. You just can't like read a rule book, you know, dump everything on the table at game night and it's all going to run smoothly. It just won't. Um, so you're going to have to put in some of your due diligence. Uh, but I don't think that necessarily means the rule books themselves selves are bad. I think they're written in a style much like a war game rule book. It's very procedural, very technical writing kind of style. Um, and that's going to just take a little bit more work to look at. So I guess I'm just throwing it out there because I just fundamentally disagree that that's a bad rule book because it doesn't baby step your way through everything. Okay, I'm going to hop in here because I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think that the, the Phil Eklund style rulebook and GMT style rulebooks are absolutely fantastic for reference once you know how to play the game. Yeah. They're really bad for learning how to play the game because they don't really explain the big picture anywhere. Right. I mean, that's a, I mean, you've got to either have someone teach you the game or invest a lot of yourself to learn those games. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to do that, which is, I mean, I'm not going to slam people on BGG forums, but I am because they're not doing that. Um, I mean, that's, that's their nature. They're great for reference. They're not great for self-learning. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the only other thing I'm going to throw on my review, because I just found out that this is a thing and that baffles me. Have you guys heard of chess boxing? Yes. Oh my God. No. Yeah. Chess boxing. Apparently it's, what it's happens amazing. is, they play a chess game and then a bell will ring and they have to put on boxing gloves and jump into a boxing ring and just beat the living crap out of each other for like two minutes. And then the bell will ring and then they have to go back to playing chess after they've like smashed each other's faces in. And this just goes like back and forth for a chess game. Yeah. Either, either you win by KO or you win by like winning the chess game. <laughs> I, I've watched yeah. this. <laughs> there are YouTube videos. Go, go look. Oh, God, there are. I'm just like, yes, there are. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Why would you, like, if you're so, the type of person who would sit down to, like, the type of strategy and, you know, appreciate your mental function, then why would you, you know, take actions that would directly lead to, like, the, the destruction of your brain cells and the, incap incap you know, incapability of being able well, to actually function? Well, maybe if you're the one boxing. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. whoa. Oh, oh, oh. I just think I think you just <laughs> challenged me to a game of chess boxing. <laughs> That's how I read that. That's like, oh, is somebody too chicken to come out and chess box me? Oh, you really <laughs> want to? I'm just a little guy, and I think this is a bad idea. Try, try to leave and spot you three pieces in an uppercut. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think uh, just to quickly comment before we moved on there, Andy, about the Sierra Madre rule books, like, yeah, I think they're fascinating to read. And I, I, I appreciate them in terms of like learning the history, which I don't think is done as well by any rule book. So they'd certainly have their merit. I think that yeah. saying this game has a bad rule book, just all in all, um, you know, like saying I struggled to learn the game from the rule book is accurate, right? But saying this is a bad rule book, or this is a good rule book. I mean, I, I learned the game well from the rules. I, I feel like that's a little bit maybe more helpful because mm -hmm. I do agree with Trent. Like, I mean, like I like trying to learn a Phil Eklund game, you know, even if I've played the game before, literally I've got games here that I have played before that are Phil Eklund games, um, you know, that, that I can't, like, it's like, oh, crap, man, going back to playing that game would be a lot of digging through the rule book, even though I feel like, I've already played the game four or five times. And I don't feel like that's ever going to be necessarily over because of how rich the the simulation content is, um, mm -hmm. which is really awesome when it can be married to, to, to you know, to stuff that makes me appreciate, um, you know, th that's more like, I guess, maybe what would be along the lines of what I'm looking for in games. So to me, it's, you know, they're not good or bad rule books. I think that what you guys said is right, is very mm -hmm. accurate. It's similar to like a war game rule book, a GMT rule book where it's very procedural. Um, but I would say that personally, I prefer a Phil Eklund rule book because it's like you take that GMT rule book and actually add flavor to it. And more than just like, you know, sort of grins and, and inside references and jokes that for people that already understand it, like it literally teaches you about the, the time period, which I think right. is something else to be said that I don't necessarily learn about in, in any other type of rule book. But well, that's the it's thing. tough one to play the them from. You can't say, Andy, that you learn them easy because I've seen you learn a game. From, like, oh, no, a no, 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 no. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's worth the investment and that it's going to require that. Mm -hmm. um the other it thing is for I, you i mean honestly mm -hmm. dude i can't see without having a, a like a group that would be really excited by it if i was the one pushing it i don't see it as being something i could continue to push onto people as they lost interest i would because it just <laughs> it takes so much effort and investment and i love the games but i think so much of that is because i have you guys around to bounce them off of right well and the other thing um with them is that that can mess with some people is and i've kind of learned this about phil Eklund over time as well is that uh the vocabulary used is really important because the game essentially is an educational game for an adult it's not necessarily just about the gameplay it's trying to get across the topic so for example if you're doing bios genesis you have a colored disc depending on where that colored disc is sitting it has different terms to it. It's a catalyst or it's an enzyme or it's something else because there's specific things they're trying to convey with that information. Um, and it's not just like move disc here. This disc does this, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's enough. I just want to get that. No, I, yeah, I, I agree, dude. It's there wants you to understand like when you move that disc, what you're doing. It's, it is right. It's, you just, it's cool you got to know what you're getting into with those games. And I think kind of as the heavy game world increases and there's this weird Venn diagram overlap with heavy gamers and Phil Eklund games, I found that people are getting into them and not realizing, like they're just hearing people like me are going, oh, these Phil Eklund games are awesome. And then they kind of jump into it, not realizing kind of what they've taken on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I agree, like, whereas, like, a, a Euro rulebook would, like, strip all of that out of it, you know, right. to try to make the game accessible and easy to learn, and and at the at the core of it, you've got gameplay, um, whereas, you know, Phil Eklund has got some games with amazing gameplay, but at its core, you know, his his real, um, you know, his, his commitment is to the historical accuracy of it, and the way right. that, it, that the game systems represent it, which... You know, is is a something to applaud and something to appreciate, and definitely something that many people really appreciate. And you too, Andy. So, and yeah. not just history, but all different aspects. So, yeah, I, I I appreciate the perspective that you take on it, but I also do think that the frustration should be something that we don't downplay because people need to know what they're getting into. 
Yeah, there was. I was at the co-host of Punching Cardboard before he kind of moved on. Said he about put a hole through his wall trying to figure out bias genesis from the rule book. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I can't say that's completely undeserved, but <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's enough of mine. Cool. Well, uh, to round it off, since we're all three rules breakers here, uh, my review is not of a board game, um, if you want to argue semantics here. It is of a video game. Um, however, I would say that this is a video game that, um, in large ways, I think will it will be attractive to board gamers. Um, it is available on PC and PS4, and I think also Xbox One, it's in, on all the recent stuff, except probably not Nintendo Switch. Uh, that one's, you know, weird and different and cool, and I, I love it, but probably doesn't get this release. It is a puzzle game, think like Portal, except um, it's a little bit more, it, it gets described as being a little more traditional than Portal, but I think that what it does, aside from where Portal's like, hey, check out this new tool, and we'll give you some puzzles that use it in interesting ways, but it's really more about like the tool at its heart, um, and, and there are a lot more kinetic-based puzzles. Um, the Talos Principle is a, it, it's like largely like a puzzle game that you could imagine like being like a sort of solo puzzle game that you could play on an app or something, uh, but it's done in three dimensions and with beautiful art and amazing music uh, to just really accompany and make this sort of feel like a, 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 an experience of higher art, I would say, um, especially when you accompany that with a story that is, um, that, that sits in between the Venn diagram of philosophy and science fiction in a really beautiful way that incorporates the artificial intelligence you are um, inhabiting you're sort of like a robot, an android of some sorts, uh, that's that's sort of uh, accomplishing these tasks for a voice in the sky, basically. And, but the way the, the logs that you uncover about your human creators and uh, all that stuff just had me on the literal edge of my seat playing this and just, like, I was ready. I was always reading the text. And this is one of those few games that delivers its story largely by reading text where that is absolutely appropriate. It all fits into the system. Um, so, so I took that, uh, you know, for what it was, I didn't like judge it and say like, oh, this is a text-based story. Like one of those video games where you're reading text that should be dialogue. This is your reading text that should be text. You know, it, like the, the computers in the game largely look like a, you know, a black screen with white text on them. And, you know, it looks like a command screen. And I, I felt like that really added though to making, to just creating the environment and, and the, it built the mission that I was on. It built who I was, the people that created me. Um, you know, as as the the player character, and I just thought it was a really beautiful game that explored its puzzles and its its different simple mechanisms that are easy to to grasp, but it explored them at a much deeper level than Portal. And as much as people love the game Portal and Portal Two, and as beautiful as they are and as clever as they are, I felt like this was a deeper puzzle game at its core. And it also had a nice way of of having you have access to more than just one puzzle. It had a really cool form of like world integration. Um, the expansion content was just absolutely beautiful and how it um, was a real exploration of community message boards and the way that this sort of a, develops in an AI environment where it's essentially everything is constructed by you know the, the human creators, but there are all these AIs that sort of behave in a, in a message board environment and you just see, see it really interesting continues that sort of exploration of artificial characters that are like you know are like publishing articles for other ais to read that are about like how humans would would eat food you know and, and how like humans all the things that humans did because the idea of food is so foreign to an artificial intelligence um so it, it was interesting uh, beautiful story something that i am sad that i that is kind of now something that i've completed though there is so, all sorts of challenges they would be ones where i'd have to look up online because you know, they were just that right perfect level of challenge. I thought it was a really beautiful game, and I highly recommend it, especially if you're a fan of puzzles and solo games. The Talos Principle is a beautiful um, video game, technically, but one that I think has a lot of shared lineage with, with uh, you know, it's just a very clever puzzler in general. Have you guys ever had a chance to approach this one? Um, I have it on my iPad as a two-play. I have not gotten to it yet. I didn't know it was even an iPad thing, man. Talos, oh, yeah. the Talos no, came out on iPad not that long ago. I've never played it. Highly, highly recommend it. So that's my review, which is the review of a video game, not a board game. So totally cheating, but we will finally make this a podcast about board games when we start talking about culling things from our collection. So um, how do we decide what to get rid of? I'm going to let Trent start this one off because Trent's done this before. You're the expert. 
Um. Okay, so I guess I can't talk for what everybody does, but for me, what <laughs> happened? What I, what what I do when I realize I need to coal is when my shelves get full, and I'm like, I I need to find room for some new acquisitions, and so I got like I try to keep my collection theoretically held on my game shelves in my office, and uh, <laughs> so what I what I tend to do is when I start realizing I'm, I'm overflowing here and I need to like pare down some games, is I start going through everything on the shelves. And I look at each title and I ask myself, what is the realistic situation where I'm ever going to pull this off the shelf again over other titles? Is there really a real situation where that's going to happen? It doesn't matter how much I love the game and I think, oh, I love it. Am I really going to pull this off the shelf again in the next five years in a realistic situation? And no matter how much I love it, if the answer is no, I pull it off and put it in a trade pile. And when everything's in a trade pile, I tend to take a lot of games down to a local game store near me that has a used game shelf where you can put games on it and they will basically sell them for you and give you 90% of what they sell for in store credit. And some other ones that might be specifically valuable and not really work for that, like things that are out of print or things that are really niche, uh, I go on like Board Game Geek and sell them there. And that's just what I do. And I... When I purge, I usually purge so that there's a there's a fair amount of empty space on my shelves. I keep mm. going through and thinking about it that way. So then I don't have to worry about it for several months and I can fill it back up and not worry about it. And that's usually because I have a ton of store credit at that point. <laughs> and I also, uh, in addition to that, I still have a ton of vintage magic cards that I occasionally sell for board games. So that's my um. hobby. Yeah, yeah. That, no, I, I mean, that's how you're able to fuel, you know, the, the, your board gaming addiction. I, I, there's a question from our comments here. Uh, what is the hardest decision to trade you have ever made? Um, I can think of ones I, I regretted getting rid of Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective because I found out later on that, that uh, people I know really wanted to play it more, and I thought none of them did, and I got a very hard time about it and ended up getting it back. <laughs> that was um, me and Mage Knight. I think I've, I maybe have done that with a couple of different games where I got rid of them and then got them again. Yeah, I, I know that one. I know that one for sure. I guess that'd probably have to be the hardest because that was when I ended up reacquiring. Yeah, but yeah. I went from the crappy story version to the nice Space Cowboys version. So that sure. it was it was basically an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> I might end up doing that weirdly with Gentes. Oh, to get the Kickstarter one they're doing no, or whatever? No, I'm not, I, I, end, I, I got rid of Gentes because I didn't think people liked it, and I found out that some people I know did like it. Uh, so I ended up late backing the Kickstarter. Sure. <laughs> so I'm basically doing the same thing with Gentes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really recent one, too. You haven't, you didn't know that for super long. No, I, I liked it, but I thought most of the people I played it with were like, eh. But then I found out that there were people that, Kind of, I'm one that they play games with that really did like it, and so yeah, I'm now regretting getting rid of it. Like, what happened to that game? <laughs> that, yeah. You know, the one with the tiles, and you only had so much space for actions. That was really neat. Can we play that again? Um, uh, sure. How about, <laughs> six, how about in six months? Yeah, that was yeah. Kinda... That's definitely the, that fire is not going to die over the next six months. Yeah. So, um. When it comes to, to space in my collection, my, my solution I've always gone over has been just like find more space and that's not a solution. Um, yeah, right, right now I'm kind of in a sad spot where I'm like, I, I've got just a giant stack of games that I'm planning to get rid of, but I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to play games. I'm too busy to sell games. It's just too much going on. But uh, I've got a large bunch of them that I'm getting rid of um, in the yeah. coming months. Now, have you, do you ever... your wife can sleep in the bed again, right? <laughs> She's filled so up I every available spot. Again, Andy. It's, it's more that I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm relegated to the couch until I get this solved. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> um, I, I would say the only thing, like when it comes to like buying a game, do you ever buy games and then, just solely plan to flip them and then have difficulty doing so. Mm, yeah, I I never buy games with the intent of flipping them. So well, um, I don't think anyone does. I mean, unless you, unless I like. I mean, there are exceptions. I went to a store one time and saw some Avalon Hill stuff for a couple bucks each, and 
I got those with the intent of flipping them because I knew I'd never play them and I knew I could get like 50 bucks a pop at least for yeah. them. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that like but, buy a lot of games and just refer to it as renting them. Like they they buy it on a whim and they're like, eh, I'll just sell it if I don't like it. I mean, I, there are people like that out there. I don't know that if that qualifies as flipping them for more money, but. Yeah, well, I mean, there are people like that. I'd say I do that to a certain extent. That's why, you know, that's, I guess that's how I convince myself. That's that voice in the back of my head that's like, no, you're fine. You can get this. And and really, like, I, I should stop. I really should. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like for me, it's, it has been recently, like, I, I feel like I've really tried to back off of Kickstarters precisely because, you know, like, when you haven't played a game, it's just really tough you know, to, to form an idea about whether or not you really should own it. And I'm, I'm getting more and more to where, like, I really want to play it before I buy it. But then at the same time, it's like, I'm doing this for the sake of, of being able to review the game, and I want to be able to have, you know, relevant content, not just here's what I'm playing. So, um, you know, to a certain extent, like, if I feel like there's a game that went to the side of the radar um, and it, it looked interesting, I might try to buy it or, you know, you know especially if I can find it for cheap, right? Um but you know it's just different like some people go go to a game store with the intent like it's like they just decide i'm going to go buy a game and they don't know what game they're going to buy right like that's just how they that's how they make their purchases same way with you know like video games or i used to do that with video games a lot yeah yeah you just it's like i'm going to go buy a game i have like you know x amount of dollars and i'm going to go buy a game and i feel like that's not the way that i really operate for me at any given time i've probably got 15 games that are in my head that are like if i saw this on sale i would go for it you know, like this, this would be like one of those things that I would be like, yes, absolutely. And I kind of wait until I can make enough of those, you know, 15 or so things that are on sale or don't seem to be getting any cheaper soon and might go out of print. And then once I can make like a, a cart full at like an online game store, you know, where I can hit their free shipping threshold, then I'll pull the trigger. And, uh, you know, like the, it, it, it's, it's, it's the sort of like that, that gray space that's like, okay, well, I've got $70 worth of games that are a really great deal, um, and that, you know, it's it's a time-sensitive sale. I only need 40 or 50 more bucks worth of games before I get free shipping. Hmm. You know, that, and that's where I usually end up in that situation where it's like, hopefully I can find something that I know that I'll, like, like I want to own this. Now, here's the thing. Like, what happens if you love, 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 love a game? But, you know, it's like one of your top games – but you don't see it getting played. Like, do you just... That's like your half my broken? collection. <laughs> well, you... So, you know, Andy keeps them, right? <laughs> Andy, Andy, I'm going to out you here, man. You mm -hmm. sold a game last night that I still own, and I felt like, how did Andy sell this game, and I still have mine? This is like an Andy game. This isn't a me game. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I sold Tramways just because kind of Trent's reason, like, I, I have very limited gaming time and I don't see that changing for at least a couple more years. Um, and I, you know, I was really thinking about it because I had Tramways and I have Age of Steam. And um, Age of Steam, I think, well, well, I still think there's room for both in the collection, but Age of Steam uh, is easier to teach the rules to and get going on. Like I just did this last night. Age of Steam is like a 10 to 15 minute tops rules teach and you can get right to it. And there's ultimately more tension and cutthroatness out of those games than I feel there was out of Tramways. Um, the other reason, honestly, I will tend to call a game is I know myself and I know what my weaknesses and strengths are. And one of my weaknesses is I'm a completionist. Um, and so the danger for me is, uh, with like tramways is Albin Viard is, is very prolific. And so like I was noticing, I was starting to collect a lot of things for tramways that I wasn't playing enough. Um, I wasn't playing enough of the base game even to justify playing the extra maps. And I knew I would just be tempted to buy everything that comes out. So I kind of did it as a way of stopping myself um, from getting more stuff that I don't really need. Like Age of Steam, I don't have that because there's so many maps that were winsome or other things that I have no no chance in hell of ever acquiring. So it just doesn't bother me as much. Um, 
but yeah, so it, it was a matter of just time, time and opportunity. It's just, I don't know. I've enjoyed every play I've had of tramways. Um, but it seems like every time I've, I've gotten people to play it, um, and then Age of Steam, people, I guess more people have come out with positive reactions to Age of Steam on the table than tramways. Um, mm -hmm. You can teach it in a third of the time or less, and it, it's more tense. So I guess yeah. I just kept it for that. Or, I mean, it's so. almost like you're wrestling with a game system more so than you're wrestling with the other players. It's a little of both, I think, but... But I Age think of Steam is very, like, rules light in terms of what mm -hmm. stuff you can do. And, and like, once you s explain the game and you look at the board, you're like, oh, I see how to, ah. Yeah. And, and so I, I think it's an excellent game. Um, I wasn't getting rid of it because I hated it or I didn't like it. It was just, you know, solely to kind of keep myself in check monetarily because, like I said. It was like a preventative it, measure almost. Right. Because, yeah. It's one of those like you've already collected like everything for it, so you kind of feel like you need to keep doing it. It's the same reason I tend to stay away from living card games, so I'm mm -hmm. not tempted to keep up with it um, when I'm not really. It's not getting to the table as is, and I'm still buying parts for it. So, well, and the other part is to kind of bring this up. Like Joe Cole's part of his collection by selling it to me. If it's any of the weird games. <laughs> um, so I had small city and I had tramways and I guess I just kind of looked at them and I'm like, I don't want to be tempted to keep buying stuff for both of these yeah. and tramways is close enough to age of steam and small city is different enough for both that I decided yeah. I'm going to keep small city, get rid of tramways, keep age of steam. Plus, you know, there's multiple people that have tramways in the group. Yeah, exactly. That's mm -hmm. everything. That was another thing. Um, yeah, for the time being, because I mean, I I had a very similar reaction to what you're saying, Andy. Only I I thought that for me, I thought there. Let's put it like this: I thought there was more space in your collection and in your interests for it than there even was in mine. Because you know, like to 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 hear what you're saying and to have that ring true, like you know, this is more your wheelhouse than mine. Yeah, like I said, it, it was a very calculated choice for yeah. me. I mean, you made was, it make sense. It, yeah, and it wasn't that I disliked the game on any level, and in fact, I I've been, I've enjoyed playing it. I would enjoy continuing to play it. If someone said, "Hey, can we play Tramways?" and they had a copy, I would not turn that down. Yeah, um, I mean, you can play like Age of Steam maps that are designed by Alvin Viard too. So I mean, he's consistently yeah. like at, at you know additional content. You know, he's one of the people who just keeps that game mm -hmm. alive. And you know, it's it's really a letter to the Martin Wallace. You know, to like that sort of you know, the, the difficult decisions you make in a deck building game, but it's like, I, I feel like I see that as playing out very similar and there not being puns that you can do. Um, but yeah, anyway, this isn't supposed to be a roast of tramways. It's just a roast of you. Andy. Yeah. Well, and I think the other times I've, cause I, I haven't called a whole lot from my collection, but if you think about it, um, the other time I've really done this was with, Star Wars Armada, because um, I had the base game of that. Um, I really enjoyed playing it. I enjoyed playing, you know, I played a few games with Trent. I really enjoyed those. But I was looking at just the sheer amount of ships coming out and the cost uh, of getting all of those and then looking at the cost of getting other board games I wanted. And I'm just like, there's no way I can do both of these. And so in those situations, I will tend to, do whatever it takes to be prohibitive to myself. So if I would have just kept the base set sitting around, I know I'd look at it and be tempted to buy more things. Um, so that's so, the main reason I got yeah. out, got got out of that as well. It is. Um, it's like a psychological thing that you did. You know, knowing yourself, know thyself, and then you know you take that temptation away. So I, I totally get it. And I think like at this point, I've decided. I'm not going to buy any more stuff for tramways because it, it is one of those that's on my chopping block. And, and one of the reasons I've, I've got it there is because I really enjoy the game just like Andy does. Um, but it, you know, it's not one that I would reach for. I think kind of goes back to what Trent said when he calls his collection. It's like, when would I reach for this? And honestly, I would reach for a few acres of snow. I still have that one in my collection because it's just such a fascinating, um, and it really, it really does the deck building part of tramways in my opinions better. 
Age of Steam does the route building and auction part better. It's just, you know, it's a cool, well-designed marriage of those two ideas. But at first, you know, it sounded like a kind of bizarre idea. And it, in practice, it's got things that really make it have like just daggers that, that uh, you know, that your economic gamers love to stab in each other's backs. And, and the game itself can do, it, can do that to you in many cases. But I, I just, you know, when it comes down to it, um, you're talking about two, in my opinion, absolute classics, timeless classics, and one that's a, a good game, um, but it's in a sea of games. Yeah. And the Carmen, only our sponsor, ever... would hate me for saying that. Carmen, <laughs> our sponsor, Game Surplus, love, love, loves Age of Steam. So, yeah. yeah. The other, I mean, the only other reason I think I've ever culled anything from my collection was, I think it was those two. There was a couple I did play. The big one, was Scythe though, because Scythe was a, a Kickstarter. And I think this is one of the things I'm careful about Kickstarters for. Um, the, the issue I think for me is I can kickstart something and then by the time I get it, like I've changed directions and what I want to explore. Mm -hmm. And and that's what happened with Scythe. Like I got the game and I'm like, this isn't a, this is not a bad game. And it's when I went, you know, when I backed it, this would have been like, oh my God, I love this thing. But by the time it got to me, I'd started playing train games and looking at war games and stuff like that. And Scythe was just, and, you know, I basically sold it to someone for the exact cost I paid for it. I'm like, this is a good game and it deserves to be in a home where it will get played. And mm -hmm. I'm just, there's never a time I'm going to call for this game. It's going to sit in my closet and collect dust. Yeah. Well, I think what, what kind of makes it a little easier, Andy, is that you've identified a niche, and that's how you're kind of able to keep your, your collection to certain games. And that's why I was so, like, shocked by, you know, what seemed like you abandoning, to a certain extent, the importance of just that niche that you fulfill. But at the same time, um, you've, you've done a good job explaining it. Mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't feel like I, I mean, you know, as much as people want to paint me into a certain thing, I'm a millennial, Andy, and I reject labels. <laughs> um the <clears throat> the thing That's is not true i know you get a lot of stuff in the mail that have labels attached to them <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I, I actually do reject <laughs> mail in and of itself the concept of, of physical letters uh no but but except you know for my mom and dad love you guys love you guys thanks keep sending them um super nice i i, I read them i definitely do read them um you know it's just like uh it, it's it's funny he because just I doesn't just want tell to write them. a response they, well, no, I'm not going to. I, here's what I do, man. I call them up on the phone and I talk to them about it. I give them that physical phone call because that's to me like, like, yeah, I haven't mailed a letter. Like I've mailed checks maybe over the last year, but I don't think I've mailed an actual written letter to an individual um, since I mailed out like, you know, the, the thank you notes for our wedding. You know, it, it's one of yeah. those things that. Yeah, like what did, it, I, what did I see? Fa like something that says Facebook today is basically uh, when your grandma used to cut articles out of papers and send them to you, except we do that digitally now. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that made the bar for entries gotten a lot lower. So yeah, like <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of problems with you know with with information age and stuff. But um, I I think though the rejecting labels that I was saying is because honestly I like when I'm when I'm like, you know, deciding whether or not to keep a game in my collection, um, I have a very hard time of deciding whether I want to be selfish about it. Because, uh, you know, like I could be entertained by a game, but what I feel like I'm thinking about more than anything else is, like you guys mentioned, like, like you know, the people that I play this with. And, and you know, if the, the issue with me, though, is that I feel like so frequently I'm, you know, I can appreciate just about any type of game and be willing to own any type of game um, you know, it's not so much the type that, that, that's distinguishing. It's just like whether or not I feel like it's a great example of the specific type. And it, it, I do kind of have to like enjoy or appreciate that type of game, right? There's certain ones that I still would draw the line at, but like, I still feel like that, that area is such a subset, right? Like, um, at, at last night at our, at our game night, we had a, uh, a group that was playing like kingdom death monster, right? And I, I just don't have any real interest because it's like the cost is so high uh, the amount of effort that you'd have to put in just to uh, to to assembling the game, you know, like if I if I, I Andy, I feel like that would be one way in which you'd have some overlap with your Kingdom of Death Monster people is that the amount of time they spend outside of the game having to prepare for the game is immense. Like, you know, 
painting and stuff like that. I, I'm just waiting for you to get into that, Andy. You know, we just need a an economic game with 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 uh, miniatures that you don't just uh, you know universally pan and reject and say, "Give me wooden discs." Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. So I have so wood, wooden discs don't degrade women as bad as those minis do. Ha! <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to argue with that, man. It's that's, <laughs> that's, that's that game that does it for sure. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some some pretty poor portrayals of women in those games. Trent, what were you going to say? I have two issues that really make me struggle with my calling strategy, and I thought it'd worth mentioning them right now. Uh, the first one, the first issue I have is I have to. It's it's easy for me to try to talk myself into a scenario in which I think I'll play a game again, but it's really never going to happen. Yeah. Like I'll visualize, oh, I'll play this with my kids in a few years. That's really hard for me to tell that that's actually going to be accurate in any way, shape, or form. That's mostly in the wishful thinking category. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, I think I'm going to play some game. I think my oldest son is a gamer. I really do. I don't think the I don't think my middle child is. I'm not sure about my youngest one at all. Sometimes I don't I don't even know where he's gonna go. I think a lot of my visions about things I'll play with them fall into wishful thinking rather than like reality. So I need to be careful about the things I'm envisioning in these great scenarios where I'll play them and what's actually realistic for me to keep it. Okay. So like that's something I struggle with. Another thing I struggle with a lot in my calling is I play solo games three or four times a week. And that means that it's easy for me to envision taking a game off my shelf one night and playing it like as a solo game. Cause like, there are a lot of evenings when everybody in this house besides me is in bed by 8.30, and I don't go to bed until 11 or something like that. So it's very easy for me to just a lot of solo game. That's what I enjoy doing in the evenings if I have some free time, not reading a book. And so it's easy for me to think, oh, I'll play this game again solo. Oh, I'll definitely play this game again solo because I play solo games all the time. But the yeah. thing is, is this really what I'm going to pull out? And that's hard mm -hmm. sometimes to convince myself that, this really isn't one I'm going to pull out. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times I wind up keeping games on my shelf that I probably shouldn't because I convince myself otherwise because those rules aren't hard and fast, I guess. Another thing I think, um, a another thing I think that makes it hard for me to do much culling in my collection is, um, one thing that enters my mind is that uh, to think about it this way: if I change my mind later, can I reacquire it? Um, so, for example, if we're looking at Sierra Madre games and uh, a fair amount of 18xx games, if I get rid of it and then, like a year or so down the road, like regret that and I want to go to reacquire it that could be nigh impossible at that point. And so I think that is a kind of a driving force for mine um, because I do tend to live in this little weird niche. Um, it becomes harder to reacquire anything that you get rid of. So it, it takes a lot before I will actually probably sell any games. Yeah, yeah. I think, though, that you're kind of, you know, yours grows a little differently. I think you know that there's more expansions and contractions um, in in my collection definitely than than yours necessarily, Andy. That's why I was like, you know, it's just bizarre to see you get rid of one game because you yeah, know, it doesn't happen very often. So rare, and like I've just got this huge. It made me feel like I'm I'm man, I'm wasting away because I I have <laughs> that game on the trade block. You know, I, I have it on like the sell block, but I just can't. You know, I I, I just need to find time. I need to really push. I need to start putting some games up in the uh, in that uh, in that game store, Trent, like you talked about. So, um, but yeah, it's it's tough. I'm trying to think over time. You know, like I got rid of Mage Knight, and then I bought it again. So you know, mm -hmm. so much of my stories of culling collection ended up being you know like games that just filled me with regret. So it's 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 tough for me to even approach you know approach it again. And I've been trying to work out a little more. Like I feel like. I don't know. Like a lot of times when I look at a game to cull, I, I do this sort of fallacy in my head and I don't think that's the right thing to do, but I consider like, is it worth the trouble to sell it? You know? No, that's um, valid. It's, 
Because like it's just it's so much effort. And if this game is like just gonna pull like twenty or thirty dollars, like that is a really tough call to make. Like I you know, is it worth it to me to really go out and, and mail this thing and drive to the post office and and you know package it and you know try to make sure that it that it that it doesn't get damaged, you know, and just you know, yeah, and, and I save like packaging and stuff around my house because I do plan on at one point like uh, once again, like doing a big auction where I just, you know, make one trip to the post office and have like 15 boxes in the back of my car that I just haul in and in, in waves. And, and, you know, that's, that's where I'm headed from now, but it is such a, I mean, unless I'm doing that big calling, I, it's tough. You know, I've seen you Trent though, you will have games that you, I've seen you dump a lot of games, uh, at once to like kind of the local group for extremely cheap prices, like basically giving them away prices. Yeah, and that crews out games on my shelves, and I know they're going to remain locally for the most part, and I'll be able to play them again in the future if I want. I'd rather, uh -huh. I would rather sell cheap locally than sell for like $10 more or someone on the other coast, and I have to deal with all the shipping too. Totally agree with that, absolutely. I just, I noticed that like, you know, maybe to a certain extent, I don't think I've seen you do that recently, but you, I know that you have still been culling your collection. Maybe it's because... Oh, he did it recently. That's how I got a copy of Wildcatters. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess... <laughs> But that, that yeah. was a very small calling, and that was things that I knew probably weren't the best for that shelf. Okay. At the, the store in Angony, so. Sure, sure. Didn't you already have a copy of Wildcatters, Wildcatters or something? Yeah, I wound, up with, I wound up with two because of a shipping error. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so. Shipping mm -hmm. error in your favor, collect $100. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah I don't know. I'm waiting for, for that to happen for me. It, well, and here's the thing. I think, you know, thinking about calling, you can fundamentally – look at the board game hobby and think of it in one of two ways. Um, we're at the point now looking at the board gaming hobby where there's just too many games. Like there's no way in heck you can ever play all the good games. There's that many good games coming out every year. And so really, if you're wanting to play a bunch of good games, you've got really two choices. Either you do your work, you know, front load it and say, which few of these am I going to buy that I think are most likely to be ones I would keep, or you kind of go the other road and you're, you buy a lot of them um, with the intention of just trying it out. And if you don't like it, I'm going to sell it. Um, mm -hmm. it what, like I said, people who rent, you know, they just refer to it as renting a board game. Um, but I think, there's just so many coming out that if you really want to play a lot of them and not just have a few that you really like, you're going to have to go with one of those two strategies. There's, there's not enough hours in a day to play them all. Sure. Here's a hypothetical question. If you guys ever heard about a game said mm -hmm. to yourself in your head, this is an Insta buy for me. Um, have you, have you ever had that happen and then have uh, later on down the road, get rid of that game? I'm sure, but none are coming to mind. And I'm sure it's happened. I think probably the closest one to that for me would have been Scythe. <laughs> well, you had that that dramatic shift in in your in your gaming taste, you oh, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, that's what happened with that. But I, not even Tramways was that. I think when I got Tramways, that was actually a gift. Uh, at one point, um, like I wasn't actually that interested in it from the beginning. Like I think you even had it at Kickstarter, and I didn't even have it Kickstarted at the time. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I mean, I think Scythe is probably the best example for me. Mm -hmm. At the time, at the time, I was like, "Oh yeah, no, total click buy, did it." And then when it came, I was like, "Okay, this looks still pretty cool." And then I played it, and I'm like, "Eh." Could could <laughs> you feasibly see? I'm going to go through a couple of of things here, Andy. Could you see? Uh, Phil Eklund's got a new game out. You don't buy it. Um, I don't know about Phil Eklund. There are Sierra Madre games I'm not getting. Um, for example, not Phil Eklund, but they have this like little abstract game called like Herp or something. It's some weird oddball name. Um, I didn't get that. They have another one coming out this year uh, from another designer, but... It's like Mission Zeta or something. And I didn't ask you about Sierra Madre games, Andy. I yeah. asked you about Phil Eklund games, and you brushed it to the side really quick to try to make it seem like, ah, uh, no, I'm I'm saying no to Sierra Madre games. Well, those those well, sound like. Yeah, we'll put it this way: if it's something 
in the PAX line or the main science line that they do. So like more Phil Eklund's or real designers who design kind of in Phil, Ex Phil Eklund's space. Because PAX Pamir, you got Cole Worley, John Company, Cole Worley, that kind of thing. Um, unless, unless finances are a real issue at the time, I no, I can't see not. Pretty much always, I'll I'll pre-order it from the Sierra Madre site. Could it be something down the road that I get rid of? That's possible. Um, and it's the way I always tell people because you'll see all these threads or pe or people will send me a message occasionally. Should I buy this Sierra Madre game? And my answer is always yes. Yeah, you're not only an insta buy for you, but it's also like. <sighs> You know, get it for everybody else. So, like, you're you're proclaiming that as like just the you know the the truth, the gospel well, of Andy. It, well, not. It, and here's the thing: is I even tell them, I'm like, you may hate this game. That's quite possible. The thing is, um, pretty much any Sierra Madre game, you're going to be able to flip for a profit if you just wait a few months. So you might as well buy it, even if you're curious about it, because. They're small print runs. They sell out fast, and if they sell out, uh, Phil doesn't reprint quickly. So you're going to be waiting years, and so it's better in my mind. It's better to get them now. For me, I'm an oddball. I probably will like it and keep all of them. But for anyone who's like convinced me to buy a Sierra Madre game, it's like I shouldn't have to convince you. You just buy it because it, there's really no loss to doing so. Because even if you hate it, you're going to be able to make some money off it. You know what I think we've touched on here, listeners, Andy, is that Andy has a completionist mindset towards oh, yeah. Sierra not Madre games. So not Sierra Madre games, Phil Eklund games. Phil well, Eklund. and this goes for many things. I mean, like when we've talked on Kickstarter topics before, it's one of the reasons I'll never buy – well, not never. But it's one of the reasons I rarely will buy a Kickstarter game after the Kickstarter. If I look at it and there's exclusives, I'll – nope, not even going to do it. I don't think there's a single game designer that has designed more than, say, 10 games that doesn't have at least one game that I don't like or that I – you know, like that I should be getting rid of, right? I don't think there's any a single designer that I'd be like, you know, I want absolutely everything by them because I know, like, you know, there's there's certain things that just are not my cup of tea, by even by my favorite designer. Well, and the other thing for me, though, I think when it comes to Phil Eklund and Sierra Madre games is I was kind of late to, to the company on that. So, you know, if you go way back in the catalog to like the lords of the Sierra Madre and some of these other ones that were a little more controversial than even his modern games, maybe those I would have hated. I don't know. I came at... Basically, when I got into Phil Eklund games was about the time you're seeing Greenland and uh, I think it, it's I, premiere. Are you not going to try to track down Lords of the Sierra Madre if you had the ability to get it? Nah, I don't really care. Why not? Because it seems to me like it's it's like sort of a precursor to Pax Porfiriana. It is, but um, from what I've heard, is it's I don't know, it's less of a game, even more closer to a simulation. And the other thing is. Um, I'm trying to avoid games that are like, like right now I'm trying to avoid trying to find old games that are out of print and going to cost like four times what yeah. they're, what they were. So I don't know, like if it's a good Sierra Madre game, it will get reprinted in the cycle again. Usually and you don't see, you don't see any Sierra Madre game is ever leaving your collection though. You'd never call those. Uh, it, it would take a lot. To get yeah. to that point. I mean, because obviously, like, if we actively play a game a ton, unless we are passively, aggressively playing this game to please others, we're going to hang on to that game. I think that just goes to say for any gamer and their collection, like, right, they're not just going to turn around and sell everything without, like, you know, some sort of a, a an anticipated shift in in financial situation or, mm -hmm. you know, like, like just, you know, interests, you know, if people feel like I, they have a new initiative, right? They, they like the year, new year came around and they're like, for whatever reason, um, this is just not working for me anymore. And then, you know, like, or, or a lot of times I think it's that more financial, you know, like you get in a pinch and you just have to get rid of even the best games. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, but I feel like so, so frequently, like now that the through the ages app is out, I don't see myself as really wanting to play the, the physical copy of the game. 
Now, yeah. do you feel that too, Trent? Because I know that you own the physical copy and the game. Andy, do you own both? I I own the game, but it, it's one of those games that for a long time kind of was in my why don't I own this category. Um, well, that's an interesting category. The- that's because that sort of like implies this sort of, you know, like like not necessarily that you wanted to play it, but just like you feel like it's part of your identity. It's your collection. Yeah, and there's really about – uh, three games right now that I think fall into that category. Probably two now. Through the Ages would have been one of them. But I think it it it, it plays so well digitally that I don't know if I would want to play it analog. Like I probably still would. I'd have a good time, but I don't know if I'd push for it. But I don't probably think I right teach now. anybody, and that would be like the main environment I could yeah. see it even getting played in, you know, outside of the the app. Like I could just, yeah, it's weird to think because I keep that game, and really I don't think I have any intention of picking up and playing it. Why am I keeping it? Mm-hmm. Uh, right now I think the two that are the why don't I owns it, own it would be Key Flower and Dominant Species. Huh. But it kind of falls into you can't have all the games. So Dominant Species surprises me, actually. I don't know why. I didn't even realize you don't own that. But it's like this sort of, you know, GMT. So representing mm-hmm. that crossover, you own other GMT games, but not oh, yeah. Dominant huh. Yeah. Oh, how come? And you use the cop-out of, well, you can't own all of the games, which is just, just a straight-up cop-out, Andy. That's what it is. Eh, I can only buy so many, really. I got to stick to some semblance of a budget. Honestly, I think for Dominant Species, um, it, it, I've only played it enough recently to where I started kind of enjoying it. And I think my taste, I haven't, I hadn't played it until we played it res- recently after my taste in games had switched. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so because you that, initially played it when before before the Beast had awakened. Exactly. So it was a little more aggressive than I would have liked at that time, but Uh I really enjoyed the last game of it. And that's kind of what put it in that category beforehand. It wouldn't have been in that category. Yeah. Yeah. I I get what you're saying. And I kind of wonder, you know, to what degree, like there's so many games that I own that I feel like I would not play them without a person that owns it. You know, like for example, I don't see myself as really playing mage Knight by myself, largely because I want to always be able to play that with somebody and if I'm playing with somebody, I don't trust myself to enforce the rules well enough. Mm-hmm. You know, like, even though I've got 16 plays of Mage Knight, I still don't feel like I want to play it with anybody who's not as experienced in Mage Knight as I am. Not because I don't want to be, I, I, because I'll feel impatient, but because, like, I need help, Andy. I'm, I'm asking for help while we were playing that game, you know, just to make sure that I'm doing everything right. Yeah, um, there's a lot of minutia in that, so. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I mean, like, there's just when I would look at my at my shelf, you know, to what degree does it want to be something that I look at it? I feel it's a part of my identity. I want to take a deep breath and feel like a sense of inspiration, even if I have no intention of ever picking up a game and getting it played. Even if, like, for example, Tash Galar, I'm, you know, for whatever reason, we're talking about all these Blada games because, you know, like he'd be one of among my top designers for sure, if not my top. But like, you know, these are games that. I would rather play Tash Kalar and like the online board game arena implementation than I would play it in person just simply because unless I found another player who was as experienced where they played 100, 200 games of Tash Kalar, I would feel like I would not be getting much out of that experience in, in a face-to-face environment, you know? Like it would just it would just not be there because, I, you know, having those hundreds of games behind me, I, I feel kind of like that, you know? It, how about you, Trent? Do you ever feel this way where you've got a game that you're hanging on to um, and it's one that you still actively play, but you maybe play it in a digital form, or it's one that, like, you played it so much, you played it just hundreds of times, but to get back to the point where you'd pick it up again, it would be a, a, a far reach, but you still hang on to it because it's, like, so near and dear to you? Sure, Settlers, because it's pure nostalgia for a period of my life from about 99 to about 2001. Huh, so you do keep keep games for nostalgia too. Interesting. That is that is the one I can really think of. And I guess my box of magic decks. Like just random magic commander decks. I don't play commander very often, but I keep that around because it's nostalgia from like many, many years in which I played magic. Mm-hmm. 
But my my binder full of cards that I'm selling, I don't feel that way about. I don't know what the difference is. But other than that, I don't think there's anything I keep just because it's like identity or nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at I'm 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 trying to think of them, but yeah. I don't have any ideas. That's the only two I can think of off the top of my head. I guess if I went and looked, I could probably come up with some, but when I look at my collection, I see just so many inspiring things, pieces of my history of, of you know, of, you know, like little, like almost all, these are all the boxes of my personality um, that, that are sitting there and, and looking back at me. And I remember that I enjoy this part of this game and I enjoy this part of this game. And when I see it, I see so much of, you know, just like things that, that bring me joy and give me inspiration. And I feel like, as an extrovert, I want to share that with other people. And so frequently I pick the wrong people to share it with and they look at it and they think, dude, you have a problem. <laughs> and, and they just, and it makes them feel so disconnected, um, you know, from, from, from me because they're like, whoa, you know, just the idea of being this deep into a hobby is, is something, you know, that I, that I think is, you know, it, it's, it's beautiful that this hobby has the depth, you know, just like the games that we love, the hobby itself has the depth to be able to do that, to, to be able to express, you know, not not four different elements of your personality, but like your personality in so many different contexts. But is that the function of a game collection? That's, ultimately that's a question that only each individual can answer. I mean, um, I, I don't, I guess, uh, I, I don't see as a necessary thing that your collection be of a certain size or, or anything like that. It, it depends what you want out of it. Ultimately, it's your life and what makes you happy. I mean, if it makes you happy to own 3,000 games, as long as you're you know, not neglecting your finances, retirement, children, or anything, who's to say that's wrong? Um or if someone says, nope, I'm going to keep it at 100 and no more. And if, well, you know, if I get to 101, one has to leave. That's fine, too. I mean, it it just depends what what it gets out of, it, gets out of it for you. I mean, there's um, – for me, there's still times where I'll just kind of look at one in the, in the closet. And there's times I've taken a game out, just kind of looked through the components, reread the rules, and I kind of get happy about that. And so mm – -hmm. Eh, it's worth keeping around for me at that point. I, so I don't I, I don't think there's a right way to say uh, well, and there may be people that are just not going to ever cull their collection, and there's not even anything wrong with that. See, and I think there, Andy, that's a really interesting like you're talking about people who are just attached that develop this bond, like it's all a feeling based thing. And now, like the logical part of my brain is what really argues with you know, like like to a certain extent, the the hypothetical situation where I bring somebody down here and they look at this collection, they're like, dude, you have a problem. That maybe to a certain extent is the voice in my own head that looks at this and says, shame on you for for identifying with this. Shame on you for identifying with this. These are tools. These are tools that are there to build, to help you to build relationships and get close to other people and to explore things that you don't, you know, ex explore the, the people, the things and the natural and unnatural phenomenon that are in the world and in art form, just a piece of entertainment to be, to be used, you know, to be used and discarded, um, you know, especially like the exit games. Like I have a buddy of mine who's, who's, who's fiance has this collection of DVDs that she clearly identifies with as part of her personality and continues to grow and grow and grow. And I'm unaware of much culling that, that has ever at any point happened. And when I see, you know, all these different movies, like, you know, I see ones that I'm like, ooh, I wanted to watch that. But it takes a certain amount of keeping up on what's new, you know, the cult of the new to make that relevant for somebody who's like well-versed in movies, right? Or, you know, you can occasionally find like a nostalgia, piece of nostalgia. But I'm sure that she spends an awful lot of time sitting there with her entire collection, you know, or buying movies for her collection that never really get watched outside of maybe once or twice, you know, where it would have been an easy rental. So, you know, obviously renting is, is, is a much different option with board games, but it certainly is a topic that, that deserves a, you know, like at least, you know, a lot of people view their collection as like a rental system as Murr does in our comments has mentioned that, that, you know, like it's, it's sort of like an open revolving door because he's got this system built where it's like, mailing and you know getting rid of games for him is extremely easy he's got all the fixings that are needed you know like the the, the sticky sticky printer stuff um you know where you can just print the label and then immediately attach it doesn't have to go to any any like tough 
you know, outside of his way. Like, I feel like I'm always, you know, just, just paying a whole bunch of like, like I'm, I'm keeping boxes. I'm using my own tape. I'm, you know, like just all this crap. But um, because I'm not like I'm not as well versed in, in keeping that sort of revolving door going, maybe I don't want to be. Maybe I don't want to be getting rid of games at such a high rate. Maybe that's that's something that I feel uncomfortable about. Maybe it's because of my experiences in getting rid of games and then regretting and purchasing them back. You know, like I, I don't know. I'm just asking questions here. I don't have any answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I really think it does come whether you call a collection and to the extent you call the collection really is about what you enjoy out of the hobby. If you're someone that always wants, if you are fully grounded in Cult of the New, once again, nothing wrong with that. If you enjoy exploring new games constantly, then it, it's going to be the odd individual that has enough monetary ability and uh, space to keep all of that. And so that's going to be someone who probably calls their collection because after they've played it a few times, maybe once, two, three times, um, they're not interested in that game anymore because it's not new. So for th someone in that situation, culling makes a lot of sense. Um, for someone like me, I would rather dive deeply into games. And, and so where I battle with myself, and I haven't figured this fully out yet, is... Um, how to slow down or stop the cult of the new in myself, because he, even I'm susceptible to, you know, Phil Eklund says, Hey, here's a, here's a new PAX game. Insta buy. Have I played PAX Renaissance enough to justify putting that game on the shelf and saying I'm done with it? Not even close. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I haven't even found that balance real well. Um, it's like you there's know, a I bunch see. of batteries. It's like there are all these different batteries, but they're also unpredictable in how they drain energy and whether or not they, you know, they have a system, you know, like a solar cell or whatever, you know, we're using a lot of metaphors here. I'm using a lot of metaphors to the solar cell that sort of regenerates and, and replenishes and raises its energy as I play the game. Whereas some games, you know, I play it five to 10 times. And I'm like, I'm good moving on. Right. Other games mm -hmm. are like, you know, just have that constant, ability to recharge but it's like you know looking at your collection is like a bunch of potential energy versus when it's actually on the table it's like that sort of kinetic in process energy right yeah and, and then also i mean in reality i'm looking at my collection right now because this last year i kind of i don't know I, I went on a binge of weird corners of gaming to explore like when some games or war games or this so right now i'm looking at it for me, a ridiculous number of games that have not even been played once. <laughs> um, but yet, do I stop myself from buying new games until I get them played? No, I haven't. I've tried to cut back. Um, so I don't know. Like, I don't know the right answer. I, I don't know if there is an answer. Like I said, it really just depends on what you want out of your gaming. If you're an explorer type and you just want to explore what's new... The, a revolving door, or, you know, a revolving door policy is probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, if you know you're someone that's never going to play a game more than three times because you've explored the mechanisms you want out of it, then why hang on to it? Um, yeah. Well, if whereas, you, here's a question. Yeah. If you buy a second edition of a game, do you mm -hmm. get rid of your first edition? Um. I am in some cases, in some cases I'm not. So, like, the the only way this is really being judged for me right now is with a, with a couple Phil Eklund games. Like, I just got Bios Megafauna 2, and uh, I still have Bios Megafauna 1. Um, however, I just kick-started uh, the new Greenland and Neanderthal editions, and... Uh, I talked to a couple friends I play games with who also really like Phil Eklund. And they're just like, hey, if you guys want my first editions, I'll just ship them to you and you can have them. <laughs> um, because they're similar enough. Like Bios Megafauna 1 and 2 are very different games. Like that was a very big change. So I don't feel bad hanging on to the first edition. And it's it's rare enough that it's kind of like a, a point of pride a little bit. <laughs> 
It's a trophy. Uh, it's a trophy. Yeah, because I hunted that down. Like that was one I hunted down specifically. Or for example, I have um, the Sierra Madre game Erosion, a card game about erosion, which is stupid, ridiculous. But um, it took me four <laughs> years to hunt down a copy of that that was not ridiculously overpriced. I still paid $35 for what should have been a, probably a $10 card game. Um, <laughs> But that one was such a it, – yeah, it's kind of a trophy. It was such a chase. It took me that many years. I'll be damned if I'm selling that to someone now. Andy, or <laughs> enough, Andy, Trent, do you have any trophies on your shelf? Um, I'm thinking. Your old school Knizia's maybe? Um, well, a lot of those aren't that many old school. I don't know. Uh, yeah. My Avalon Hill 1830, but it's beat up. Um. <laughs> D um, Dune, but it's also like a handmade version. When I say when I say trophy, I mean a game that you own that you own kind of like Andy does with Bios Megafauna, where he's not like you're not necessarily planning to go back and play that, Andy. It's like you have this sort of attachment, you know, because of the process that you went through or because of how it identifies you as being a part of like, you know, this specific group and it shows to what level that you are. It's almost like this is your cred as as a heavier gamer, as a Phil Eklund fan, you have these all. I don't have a game on my shelf that I don't I don't hope to play or recently did have the hope to play. Okay. So you 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 did what like you when you called your collection you kept no. it to that. My, and I my, feel problem, like my problem is I often overestimate what's realistic for me to be able to play. But yes. everything I keep <laughs> is because Everything I keep is because I have a serious, legitimate intent to play it, and I think I will, yeah. whether that's realistic or not. How, mm -hmm. That's kind of a different – actually, that'd be a topic for a good podcast anyway is how much is too much or something. Like, I mean, I, I've binged on games way more this year than I'll – like I said, my, my shelf of two play is ridiculous for the amount of time I have to play games right now. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, which is interesting, Andy, because like, I'm sure that mine is probably larger, but like, I don't know, to a certain extent, you know, like, what is it me versus what is it that I'm just not getting in the right environment, you know, and, and to what extent am I in control of that? It's an interesting thing, like, because when we do use a fairly similar criteria that I'm hearing here, I do think, though, that Andy, yours involves a little bit maybe more personal identification with it. Like, I feel that current that you're talking about. But then like, like I, like I voiced earlier, that logical part of my brain tells me, no, you can't do that with these. These are tools. Like you have to like, just like you would if the if a tool got replaced by something better, you would get rid of your old tool and get that one if you needed it. Mm -hmm. So need is an interesting word though here. <laughs> let's not let's yeah. not bring that There's word up nothing, because nothing's a need in this level, yeah. No. Um well or or you can think of it that because for me there almost is a need that, that relates to uh, the completionism aspect. That's why I tend to get rid of it. If I'm not going to be able to play a system, I tend to get completely out of it so that I have no drive to, to add to that completion. Yeah, it's like you need to go cold turkey from it. You just need to totally wrench yourself away from it because I can sense, you know, that sort of being pulled towards a certain thing. So I, I definitely mm -hmm. get what you're talking from. And I feel like the, all the currents you guys have talked about, I feel like, you know, there are pieces of those um, that, that represent my philosophy. And it's somewhere out there in the ether and still really being decided. And so much is dependent on, um, you know, at, at the current point, just like, I, I I want to improve my state. Like I don't feel content being where I am with so many of these games to get rid of. Like I really need to get on top of it. And if and if if it's I have that bad of a problem, then I really need to just stop buying games until I get rid of these games. Regardless of whether or not I want a game, I I need to like start sort of setting myself those those you know requirements. So anyway, thanks guys for this uh, very enlightening discussion into um, maintaining and culling a collection. And uh, let's go ahead now and hype some stuff uh, out, out, out there. Let's go ahead and start with, first of all, uh, Trent's um, problem with his ability to control his, his bladder on uh, the, the seventh continent. Well, that depends, Joe. That depends. <laughs> okay, no. so... I got I got seventh continent in the mail a few days ago off of the Kickstarter and 
I got it mostly intending it to play solo, and I got it out, and I opened the box, and I'm like, wow, there are a lot of cards in this box. <laughs> and I started trying to figure out how to organize them, and I didn't even get through the full organization process and, like, reading the rulebook before I was like, hey, look, two and a half hours have vanished. And so I just put everything back in the box, and I thought, I am looking really, really forward to digging into this. But it turns out that I may need more time than that. I did kind of start playing the first scenario, and it just looks fascinating. It really looks like a soloable D and D in a box. I don't know how else to put it like that. That's what it really felt like as I was playing it. Um, I don't know what to even compare it to. It, <laughs> Mage Knight, Mage Knight is not the right comparison, but I could see yeah. why people might make that. Just simply because of how it feels like an adventure in a box, but it's it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to digging way deep into it, and I'm I'm intending it solely as a solo experience. Mm -hmm. Solely solo, solely, solely solo, solo, and as a soulless solo experience. I don't know if that's soulless, but <laughs> no, <I> just <laughs> soulless. That would be right up my alley, right? That's if I hear a game being described as soulless, I get like, ooh, it, it gives me, it, it starts to, you know. So you're, what you're saying is you like Splendor. <laughs> Actually, Trent, I started playing the Splendor app, and all that embellishment. I, I would have to say though, at its core. It still kind of feels like this is just recipe making the recipe. Making. It is. That is what that is. That game it is soulless recipe making, but they just threw a bunch of pretty pictures on and like poker chip components, and everybody's like, "Ooh, poker chips!" I get poker <laughs> chips every time I play an eighteen XX game, people, and, and a lot more. I, and that you actually get a game there rather than just collecting recipes. Okay, the, enough. Enough. Yeah. That's enough. <laughs> All right. So for my hype, I'm going to hype the uh, I, I, the Splendor app. <laughs> I, I, check mark by the Kickdown Splendor box and check mark by the Tuesdays with Mori box. I'm done with the episode. <laughs> oh boy. Yep. I'm you got, you got hunger game training days. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> hunger game is bad. Hey, but okay. At least, that, yeah. at least that's a game. Ooh, yo. Ooh. Well, I'm, I'm certainly going to talk about a game here. This is one that I've heard mentioned. I believe it was mentioned in one of our, our chats uh, for for uh, the Good, the Board, and the Ugly Guild, which if you haven't checked out, totally be a part of that. I, I'm sure that I'm, I've got listeners here that are that are from that because I, I kind of advertised it on our guild, and we've got we just had a very solid um, chat here with lots of viewers, and it's great to hear from you all. Um, anyway, I'm talking about a Kinesia game. That I, like I said, got heard mention of, but it's Taj Mahal. Um, it's called Taj Mahal, and I've not like ever seen the game. Um, I've not a, had a chance to play it, but it's getting reprinted with what seems to be new artwork, and I think it's Z-Man that's reprinting this. So once you see it on the shelves, pick it up, otherwise it's gonna be gone. Uh, good old Z-Man there for you. <laughs> but uh, Trent, have you had experience playing Taj Mahal before? No, no. It's like I I mentioned in our little group chat. Uh, is the one big Kinesia from the 90s I never got to play. And I actually like squealed when I saw that this was getting reprinted <laughs> in the nice version. Because it was one that I've always intended to pick up and just kept missing. And I think given the fact that it's coming out at Gen Con and I'm going to be celebrating my birthday very close to Gen Con and my whole family is going to Gen Con, that I might be coming home with it. I think there's a good chance of that. Yeah, I think you're going to. By the way, the Is whole... Is that going to be one of your birthday presents? Your wife stands in line for you things? Yeah, she did that a few years ago at Gen Con. And I, <laughs> I have a feeling the way I reacted to Taz Mahal, that's probably going to happen again. <laughs> I feel like for me, the <laughs> why don't I own this that you talked about, Andy, is when Trent goes to BGG Con and comes back with like Gaia Project. And for like two weeks, I'm like, or not two weeks, for like, what was this, like four months? months? I was like, why don't I own this? Like, you know, it, oh, do I have that's, that's a distribution oh, issue. Goodness. Do I keep <laughs> Terra Mystica? It was the first podcast like ever did, you know, in podcasting. But it's not, I don't want it to be a trophy. I want it to be, ah, man, this, yes, the topic is over, yeah. but my brain is not. <laughs> you keep Terra Mystica because it has wood. So that's that was uh, <sighs> my hype of Taj Mahal, but the Reiner Kanichi <laughs> one I'm really looking forward to. And now Andy's going to talk about the big thing on Kickstarter from Capstone. Yeah, so I'm going to – I think I hyped this before. Anyway, I'm going to hype it again. So um, the Estates is on Kickstarter currently. 
Um, so this is uh, Noya Jaime 2.0. Um, if you've you know played this, if you played Noya Jaime or heard of it, you've probably already kickstarted this. If you haven't, um, and you like unbelievably brutal auction games, uh, this is a game you want to get. It looks cute. It looks all nice and and fuzzy. There's little little houses you're gonna build on roads and. Oh my God, it's a knife fight in a phone booth, like horribly. Um, a legitimate strategy in this game is to get no points and drive everybody else as negative as possible. Um, I've seen people post winning scores where the winning score was negative four um, <laughs> as an auction game. And uh, anyway, it, it's just really, I don't know, from what I hear, it's the most brutal auction in board gaming, period. I want to try it. I am backing it. Um, it looks like it should be a really nice version of it once it's all said and done. Uh, there's some nice stretch goals, and the stretch goals are all uh, aesthetics. Um, the only thing that they really changed about the actual gameplay um, was what, in the original game there were blank roofs. So, like, usually you build up little blocks, then you put a roof on, and it's done. Um, the blank roof was basically a lose-your-turn mechanic, and when they discussed it with the designer, even the designer was like, I don't know what I was thinking with that. Um, so they just took it out. Uh, one of the possibilities is they might put the blank ones back in the game as a stretch goal. However, they might change the way that rule works a little bit. So... Um, Anyway, I'm they really. Changed. I know that there's stretch goals. There's, I mean, Andy, I don't I, like. There's an elephant mm -hmm. in the room right now, and it's that there's been some controversy surrounding um, the way that they did their stretch goals. Is oh it, yeah, with want... the colorblind thing because it was one of the high level ones. Um, from what I understand, reading the comments, yeah, that was resolved. Uh, so, if I remember right, what Clay said was he would include if they did not hit the highest stretch goal, which was silk screen. Um, different patterns on the different colors for color blind uh, access and in making that easier. Um, from what I remember is he's going to include no matter what stretch goals are unlocked a sticker sheet if nothing else. Okay, cool. very very cool. Here's what I, I did want to comment about this because I want to say um, that like when it happened before uh, where a Kickstarter added like a. A, like an accessibility goal. This is the first time I've seen it with accessibility um, that was like toted as accessibility um, or touted as accessibility. And then earlier, I think the biggest controversy was when Ted Osbach wanted to add uh, female artwork to a game and like like totally mm. advertised like, like, you know, like let's hit the stretch goal so that way there can finally be women in the game. And like the thing is, here's, here's I think the main issue with, with what Clay did and what Ted did is that they were trying to market it to sell a game like based on these issues and what you do when you do that you're kind of you know like and i don't think they meant to do this i think that like they're marketing people and they're like okay how can we get to this group of people how can we market to this group of people right they have that sort of like business mindset which makes sense that they would be trying to entice people to spending more for whatever cause they can and the issue here is that when they brought out that and they kind of made it the thing it's like just like with with racism one of the ways that racism works is that the, the person that brings it up is the racist. Even if you're trying to like say like, no, what you said is racist. No, actually, you're the one who's racist for bringing up that because I didn't say it for that reason and you minced my words to make race the issue here, okay? And and that's where I think this is at. Like had, had Cole or had, um what's his name? Had Clay not sold it that at accessibility if we get to this high number of money, I don't think anybody would have had an issue. But here's like, you know, like, so I think that's, that's kind of like my take on it, but here's the biggest thing that I want to say, like the people that go after folks, like the sort of social justice warriors, and I can very frequently feel myself to be counted among them and, and understand frustration that they feel. But here's the thing, like by demonizing people, by trying to put people down, like people make mistakes. You have to allow people to like understand. And I under, and I do know that like, you want to make a big enough stinks so that it can't just be ignored like if you really want somebody like especially like like clay is not going to try to like make you know he's not trying to make an issue out of like colorblind people you know like he's he's just wants to add this to the game but he doesn't have the money to do it it costs a lot of money to add silk screen components like understand yeah. that and it, you know it's like don't make this sort of like put him on a spin and roast him and i feel like well frequently and i think though clay handled it right 
Because mm-hmm. what yeah. he did is when the initial comments came back with that, like I, I truly think looking at it, his thoughts were not that it was color blindness. His thoughts were the silk screening. Um, and sure. so what happened was, you know, a, a couple people in comments brought that up that they were just like, I would really like to back this, but I feel strongly about about this issue. And Clay was very quickly to come back with, yeah. I see, your point. I see your point. Yeah. Can you can you message me and tell me what you suggest? Like, let's work together to, to resolve this as an issue. I didn't think about this when I did it, but I can see where you're coming from. Let's let's work this out. And that's ultimately what led to the sticker sheet. So I think yeah. the only danger in that, I can see where you're going with, you know, don't, don't jump down their throat initially. I think that that yeah, some people could be very hyper reactive. People were like a- outraged about it, right? And yes, like something felt de- weird to me. Something felt off about that mm-hmm. being a goal. Like it didn't feel like it was right. Like in my head, like I thought, you know, this doesn't seem right. But I felt like there was a lot of just outrage over it. And yes, I mean to 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 discuss it, like to to be like you know, kind of you know, adults that are understanding that you know, people don't people don't just want to like subjugate and and put down, you know, uh, like it's not something that people shoot out for. I do understand that in our current political climate, it feels like to get to get a point across, you have to make a big stink. But at the same time, it can just further a divide that people perceive between, you know, like what they feel to be issues that matter to them that are relevant and, and what they feel to be like people that are that are like sort of twisting it to gain attention for themselves. And, you know, when it comes down to it, I don't think people are really trying to do anything devious. You know, it's just, it's a matter of, yes, make a point of it, but it kind of frustrates me when I see somebody who, you know, like when it just keeps popping up on lists of like, this was like one of the worst ideas anybody ever had. It's like, yeah, just crucify the guy, why don't you? So anyway, yeah, I guess that was, you know, I do agree largely with with the movement. (laughs) I agree with keeping people with like, you know, protect, we need to make sure that, prote- that groups that are minorities are not, you know, like are, are not being made as an extra asset to be added to a goal to where like, we'll make this now cater to a new group of people. Hey, so if you want this game to be relevant for you, um, but you know, it's interesting, like, where do you draw the line between, because like, if you want the game translated to another language, how about making that a stretch goal? If you want to see this game in Italian, we'll only do that if we hit $15,000 you know, or whatever it is, you know, that's just like a random example, or you want this game in Spanish. So I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I really agree, Andy. I didn't mean to make this about that discussion so much, but I just feel like tr- clay handled it very well. And I think that when a developer handles it, well, it's just going to die out. I just did want to say like, you know, like, yes, you can be frustrated and outraged, but as soon as you make that, like the retweet syndrome is as, as Mer's kind of saying, it mm. becomes, it makes it feel like, is this really about the issue or is this just about like, let's, let's, you know, here's a cross for us all. Here's a hill for us all to go die on. Yeah. And I think the, the only final two thoughts I'll throw in is I think as an individual, I just try to always assume best intentions. Yes. So did they make a mistake? But let's Except in your classroom, Andy. Oh, those are middle schoolers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, their, boy. their brains aren't fully developed yet, so we we you got to take that into it. But, two things, right? Always assume best intentions, and and um, I think it's also important important to acknowledge that the three of us here are white males. Like we we don't experience we don't experience the hardships that some do. Where we, what I'm saying is, always assume best intentions. That that kind of works on for the people that belong to groups that have been attacked. Like for them, there may be a deep emotional reason for why yeah, they feel threatened. Like a PTSD sort of thing that, that comes yeah. from. Yeah. Like, cause we don't experience that as people yeah. belonging to that group. And so they might be hyper reactive cause they're sick as crap of being marginalized. Oh yeah. And, and so I think it's good to assume best intentions on both sides. Yes. That's the a good, very, very good point to make. And I, yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. that's enough beating that beating that one. So it is, it is definitely, and I don't want to turn myself into the the you know like I become the the you know the condemner becomes you know like am I self condemning <laughs> there because it, it it's just is one of those issues where I felt like to make it that big of an issue does in many ways make me think about that like we're the first person to bring up 
that 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 a certain person has a certain race is the racist one you know like that's like yeah. even if they're like oh no i was saying that they were good at this or i was saying that you know the fact that you made that an issue that's racist like in and of itself because you are relegating them to a certain identity and you are not looking at them as an individual that has the same abilities and you know same same depth of, of personality that you do right so this comes uh, and, back, this this whole conversation comes back to one thing Online text communication is really, really, really bad at conveying nuance and feeling and the little details we get from face-to-face -face communication and even voice communication. Mm -hmm. People read way too much and do way too little online all the time, over and over and over and over and over. People think that they're being disacknowledged or insulted when somebody's just trying to communicate their core idea in five words. Yes. It's, it happens all the time, thousands and thousands of times a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i'm becoming a luddite about the internet by the way so <laughs> i'm i'm becoming more basically on like almost a daily basis i'm becoming more and more disappointed with the internet mm -hmm. so take that for what you will yeah yeah no i i, I get it and and honestly like i didn't mean you know i saw some very thoughtfully worded um you know so it wasn't like everything i saw was was this specific thing it just like let's put it like this we, like there's a certain relationship that we have and, and seeing like all the good that clay has done in terms of taking games and then going that extra mile with them i mean to me i think you know like he's done so much that when i saw this maybe it was like i finally start to i i felt a little bit like like it was an attack on you know but then at the same time like you know, is, should, is, is that me excusing something that shouldn't have happened in the first place? So I really don't know. Like I said, I'm just here to ask questions. I have no answers. Well, and I think that the one final thought on that is ask a question before you're outraged. Mm hmm. Yeah. And a lot of times if people can realize like, hey, this, you know, you know, what you just said to me, I outlined something that I did not intend. You know, I did not intend this to be taken as, you know, we only cater to this group if if we get a certain amount of money like you know they're you know they're they're sort of like second rate they're not just worth being thrown in the base game um I, i'm sure that that wasn't the intention by either of those designers um but you know with a little bit more maybe uh you know focus group testing so to say um it, it could have happened prior to being a public issue and so maybe in, in, in and of itself, maybe, you know, with the designers listening could, could take, you know, take that to heart. Maybe um, we could just all end up being able to enjoy our games and enjoy, especially the people that we play them with, which could come from any, any, you know, any category out there. Um, I, I would love to play games with you, regardless of any of those types of things that society might might try to identify, identify a label and attach it to you. I will, you know, as a millennial, I will accept no other millennial, well, no other label except the term millennial, and uh, I will play games with 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 any of you, except uh, except Andy. <laughs> P and people named Andy. It's a PTSD thing, PTSD thing, guys. I, I I'm sure everybody understands where I'm coming from. Hey, has any of you ever played Tammany Hall? Yes. yes. Okay. Do you think Tammany Hall is a racist game? I mean, it, it like race is a huge issue in the game. Like, you know, whether or not you've got like I, the, the groups are identified by that. Like Keyflower could have been kind of like that, too. But because it's historical and because it's like based on this sort of actual historical um, sort of grouping that these, you know, that was kind of done naturally. And that kind of happens. Like, is it something that shouldn't exist? You know, um, or you're the people that are, you know, I would say here's the thing. Like, you're not specifically like you know, keep this part here, keep this part here. It's just like, you know, that their nationality is an element of the game just the same way it was in that time period. I don't know, Trent. What do you think? Um, I feel much the same way as you did. It's trying to capture a historic period and make it understood through game mechanisms, and I think it does that well. I I, I have a hard time viewing things like that as being strictly racist. I think because you're it's not it's glorifying so the separation. It's just like this is yes. an element that that you have to react to. It's not like it's not like here's a yes. Confederate war hero that was put up like in the 1930s, way after the Civil War. Yeah, I, I think I think I give historical games that are trying to really dig into the realities of a period, a pass on some racial racial issues. I think if you try to make something equivalent to Tammany Hall today and did it about like 
school integration or something, you'd be in real hot water real fast. <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. Yes. If you did like a Brown versus Board of Education game that was about like integration, unless you were specifically working towards integrating schools, you know, if it was like a cooperative yeah. game, it could be handled. But I don't think, you know, like a competitive game uh, about the Holocaust, a competitive game about like, you know, school desegregation, like these are just not things that you don't want to put people in control of, of okay. you know, like. I, I think if it's obvious, I mean, if you sit down and look at a game and it's obvious that they're trying to convey an idea using game mechanisms and they're not doing this to like promote like negative stereotypes, uh, and sometimes that can be a funny line, but I think as long as you're trying to be on the right side of it, I don't view it as racist. I just brought that up because that was actually a discussion I had with someone recently, and it seemed to kind of relate to what we were talking about in a way. As yeah, well, no, it makes sense. Tammany Hall would be a racist game. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think it was. So no, I I don't I don't either. So I, I can't say exactly. I, I should stop development on my game about gun rights. Uh. I don't know. I mean, that's just a hot topic. That's not like, like the thing is like, you're not talking about a specific, like, you know, it's that's not like true. a protected group. So, I mean, it's like, you could go ahead and, and make that a game, but it would be a heck of a messy topic. And I yeah. wonder if the game would have to, you'd have to reflect that, you know, packs. Yeah. Pack packs, a uh, rifling squad or rifle squad. Ooh. I don't know, man. <laughs> packs ends up in brawl in game. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Oh, if it just ended in a brawl, it wouldn't be so bad. It's that we have guns that are just essentially like it's it's easy. It's just a press of a button to make all your problems, all of your problems, go away, or all of your problem people go away. So, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's the thing is, uh, It'll this is solve the AP problem real quick. Yeah. I mean, no, I'd say, God. All right, moving on. <laughs> we did. I mean, we did. This is an interesting way to sort of like you know. It, even it all out, I do think that there is like a way that we we all are in this together, right? We're all part of the same team here. And to make like, you know, sort of moving forward the idea that everybody has access to games and that every group should be should have the appropriate access to games, um, you know, is is definitely like one of those core ideas that I think can help bring us together. You know, any sort of hom homogene homogeneous this in in you know like in marriages which should be really really um you know like when i say homogeneous i mean like you know people marrying their relatives which is really bad just like i think a, a culture to a certain extent if it tries to do that um you know we've seen that it's the diverse cultures that seem to continue to flourish and thrive and just the same way with like you know just moving forward progress uh, diversity breeds that so i i think you know we have common ground it's our job to find it Board games are a great way to do it. What do you guys think? Oh, I'd agree. I'd agree for the most part. Yep. Mm -hmm. board, board games are how I figured out I was an extrovert. I just needed, <laughs> needed, I needed a context that I understood the rules. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, it seems like this is a good stopping point for us to, 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 you know, to wait until next week to continue, I guess, the, the ever going crusade here to keep, uh, to keep everybody together and everybody together at a table um, and to somehow get that darn game that's been sitting on my collection all year for the last two years to finally, finally get that thing played. So um, hopefully that all makes sense to you guys. I've been the host of Good, the Brother, the Ugly, Joe Sound. I've been joined uh, by Andy Dennison. Thanks for being here, Andy. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Trent Ham as well. Mr. Good night. Tuesday. Good night, and is there, is there a Tuesdays with Maury good night quote? I, I don't remember, not off the top of my head. No. <laughs> Join us next week as we re review mouthwashes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably be a little bit better than we were talking about before the episode here with adult yeah. diapers. Okay, so. win winter green, winter green or mint? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well it depends man you also got the type that, that that stings and doesn't sting and then sometimes okay. when i try to gargle with it it just like bubbles up and just covers my entire face before i can even really get much of anything yeah. done we, we should do a mouthwash ta mouthwash tasting as part of the episode mm -hmm. yes and then we should consume a certain amount of it just you know to, to test how toxic it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> this has been this week's episode of the good the board and the ugly have a great week of gaming and catch us next week on the good, the bored, and the ugly. Good night, y'all. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an awesome time. Sorry you missed out, Luke. We'll see you guys next week.